All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mukhtiar. We'll be talking today about understanding the MPLS OAM capabilities, and we'll talk about the scenarios and, and how to troubleshoot with these tools that we have developed uh, uh, for MPLS. There are two parts of this presentation. Uh, I'll cover first half and then Mois will cover the second half. In the first half, actually I'll cover the MPLS OAM uh, tools itself and uh, LSP ping and LSP trace echo packets and how actually it's different from the regular ping and uh, regular trace and uh, what kind of problems we are trying to solve with LSP ping and trace and why we couldn't use the regular LSP, uh, regular ping and trace uh, to troubleshoot some of the problems. So and again if you have any questions you can uh, Stop me and I'll try to answer during the presentation or if you want, you can wait all the way till the end. Uh, so here's an overview, an agenda of the presentation. First we'll cover with, uh, cover in the MPLS network, what we mean by uh, some of the applications and, and uh, what kind of tools and what kind of problems that we may see and how we can troubleshoot them. And then we'll look at the existing ping and trace capabilities, like IP ping and IP trace. And uh, then I'll talk about why we cannot use the same tools to troubleshoot some of the MPLS problems. Uh, then we'll, we'll move, on, move on to look at LSP ping and LSP trace. We'll see what is the theory behind the operation and uh, uh, one of the fundamental things that we'll talk about is the MPLS echo packet and the contents of the echo which enables all of these features. And then the uh, second half, uh, we will look at some of the troubleshooting scenarios, both uh, in the MPLS VPN traffic engineering and the regular uh, LDP case. And uh, we'll finish the presentation with some, some summary. So if you look at the typical MPLS network, we may have different application. I guess we have, I have to stay here. Uh, we will, in a service provider environment, we will have applications like uh, L3 VPN or pseudo-wire for the layer two, uh, or maybe traffic engineering inside to optimize or, or uh, traffic engineering to uh, steer the traffic or maybe fast reroute. So we, we might have different flavors of MPLS, uh, LDP based, MPLS VPN based or traffic engineering. And uh, if it's pseudo wire, then we will have these attachment circuits. So the point is that we will have a wide range of uh, uh, applications in MPLS and each one requires a different way of troubleshooting the, the problems, and I will talk about some of them. So one of the existing uh, typical troubleshooting tools that we use, very regularly we use ping and, and trace route. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. This is, uh, uh, of course, too basic. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that in, in uh, ping we will have uh, two types of packets, uh, echo uh, request and, and the reply packet. And uh, also we will have a, a optional field to measure the round trip, uh, round trip time or RTT. Uh, and of course IP ping is uh, based on ICMP. Regular IP trace route, we have um, also ICMP but it's uh, uh, carried in a UDP packet. Uh, and we have also TTL fields in trace route to uh, uh, track e each of the hops in the in the network. To to look at closely how the trace route works in the regular environment, this is IP only. This is not MPLS. So if I do a trace, a trace is initiated from R1. Of course, R1 sends the packet with TTL1 
on the next SAP router, R2, the TTL expires because each router will decrement the TTL by one and sends a reply back, error message back to R1, and at that time, the router will print the first hub uh, in, in the trace uh, output. Similarly, then we'll increment the TTL by one, the TTL becomes two, now the reply will come from three, and so on and so forth until uh, we see the whole path along the, uh, in the network. Now, in the MPLS environment, the things are a little different, and we don't do the trace in the same way. In this case, what happens is when R1 initiates a trace, the packet does go with TTL1, but now it's an MPLS packet. So we copy the TTL from IP into MPLS label, so the TTL is still 1. When R2 receives it, R2 decrements the TTL in the, in the MPLS label by 1, TTL becomes 0. So uh, it generates an ICMP error message. And that error message should go back to R1. But because this is an MPLS environment, the assumption is that R2 or R3 or all the core routers in the network may not know exactly where this packet was sourced from. Okay? And therefore, what happens is we send the packet to R2. R2 actually doesn't send the reply back to R1, but R2 creates that error message and forwards that packet as if it's a regular MPLS packet all the way to R4. And how is he able to do that? Because the label, in this case, R1, the, the label which was used, 67, it corresponds to an LSP, and that LSP terminates, it, terminates on R4. So R2 has these instructions not to send a reply back, but if it's an MPLS encapsulated packet, and if it generated an error message, he's supposed to forward all the way to R4. Now imagine that R1 is in San Jose and uh, R4 is New York, and R2 is Las Vegas. So we are trying to ping the packet uh, trace it, uh, 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 and we are hoping that the message will come from R2, but that message actually goes all the way to R4, and then R4 sends it back because R1 and R4 are, are at the boundary of the MPLS network, and assumption is that R1 and R4 will know exactly where this packet came from, what was the source address, and when the reply comes back from R4, the source address becomes the destination, and R4 knows exactly what label to use, and that error message is encapsulated into MPLS, and R1 sees that message back. At this point, R1 will print the first hop, because when R1 receives that message, and when it processes it, it realizes that actually this message the payload of that packet contains the error message which was generated by R2. So at that point, R1 prints that and we see that the, the message, uh, the first half is shown as R2 and we uh, feel as if the message came directly from R2. Actually, it didn't come from R2, it had to travel all the way uh, across the network. Now, similarly, this is only for the first half. Now R1 will increment the TTL by one. Now TTL becomes two. R2 in this case, when he receives it, receives the packet, it will have a TTL of two, decrements the TTL by one, so it is still switchable. Now R3 receives it, R3 will receive the packet with TTL one, and at that point, the TTL will uh, expire because before R3 does anything, he's going to expire. He's going to decrement the TTL by one, so TTL becomes zero, and he generates the error message. But again, R3 won't reply back to R2. Instead, he'll, he'll forward to R4, and R4 will then send the reply back, and this process will keep going on till uh, we see all the hops in the network. 
Now, one of the important things to realize here is that if something is broken between the last hop router, for example, R3 and R4, and if you do a regular trace, trace uh, to the destination, in MPLS environment, you won't even see a reply from R2. And why is that? Because R2 actually, even the TTL was one, R2, before the packet can reach R1, R2 send the packet all the way to R4. And the link here is broken, for example, or LDP is broken or something. R1 will not see even the first hop in the trace, and you will see all the stars. So there's the problem in the regular trace. We cannot use a regular trace to pinpoint exactly where the problem is. In this case, if I do a trace, even the first stop will show all the stars, even though the problem is not the first stop. The problem is somewhere down the road. So we cannot use the regular trace to troubleshoot this type of problem. Okay? And this is not only um, uh, in the regular MPLS, but it can be MPLS VPN environment. We will have exactly the same thing, uh, except that in MPLS VPNs, we will be using two labels. Of course, the router will be looking at the top label only to do the forwarding. And here's an example where um, in, the, in the trace, we will see all these hops with the two labels. But the router will be looking at uh, uh, and switching based on the top label, which is the LDP learn label. So we have the same problem either if it's a, a LDP based or MPLS VPN based uh, environment, even uh, actually, or even traffic engineer traffic engineering uh, environment. So this is why some of these tools were developed in ITF to address some of these problems. We will actually look at a little more closely some of the troubleshooting scenarios uh, uh, in the later part of the presentation. Now let's take a look at what we mean by LSP ping and LSP trace and what, is the, what it contains in terms of the packets. LSP ping, uh, the way LSP ping and LSP trace works is actually very similar to IP ping and IP trace. One of the differences is that LSP ping and trace is based on, a, uh, it's a UDP packet, it's not based on ICMP. Okay, and there's a fixed port, UDP port 3503. Whenever a router receives packet with UDP port 3503, that will be considered as a either uh, LSP ping, uh, 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 LSP echo or request, uh, echo request or echo reply packet. And the theory of, the way it works is something like this, as shown in this uh, slide. In this case, for example, if we do a, a ping from R3, and we are pinging to R1's loopback address, for example. Before the packet leaves R3, R3 will generate a, what we call a LSP echo request, uh, MPLS echo request packet. And in that echo request packet, we will have an uh, echo packet, and then an uh, IP encapsulation on top of that, and then, of course, it's an MPLS environment, so we will have a MPLS encapsulation or MPLS labels on top of that. Now, one of the things, what is, what is inside the echo packet, we will see in the, uh, in the later slides, but let's look at what the IP source and destination IP header looks like here. The source address will be the outgoing interface address, for example, in this case, say if the outgoing interface is, is pass 00, so pass 00's IP address will be the source address. Whereas the destination address will always be from 127.0.0.0 slash 8 block. And router will pick one of these addresses uh, if it's not already in use. And you can recognize this address, 127 block is, actually it's a non routable IP address. So when a router receives a packet with destination 
127, say 127001, that packet in the IP environment should not be forwarded, but it's punted to the CPU and that should be locally consumed. Okay? So why did we use this address? I will talk about this uh, on the next slide. Uh, or maybe on this slide, but uh, let's see how by how what happens and how each starter handles uh, this packet. So R3, this packet leaves R3 with label 50. It's the NTLS packet. When R4 receives it, R4 in his NPLS table, forwarding table, it will say if you receive a packet with label 50, it should be switched with 49 and forwarded towards R2. Now, R2 receives it. R2 is the penultimate hop router, so he's going to pop the top label and forwards uh, IP packet to R1. At R1, because it's the IP packet, he looks at what the destination is. Destination is 127. By looking at the destination, this packet is punted to CPU for processing. And when the router processes, after it removes the IP header, it looks at the contents of echo, echo packet. In the echo packet, we have some information which tells the router what exactly to do with that information. And based on that, router will send a reply uh, back to the, the reply will be sent to the source, source address. So in the reply, source address becomes the destination address. So the reply will come back to R3. And at that, at that point, because the reply is coming from R1, the source will be the outgoing interface address, in this case, pass one zeros, and destination will be whatever the source address was in the uh, echo request packet. So in this case, everything is normal, right? So we don't know what exactly, why, why did we use even or what the contents of echo packets are. But if we look at closely, if the LSP gets broken somewhere in the middle of the network, okay, for example, the LSP is broken between RS, uh, R, router 4 and router 2. And LSP may be broken because maybe someone uh, did no MPLS IP or, uh, or they disable LDP or, or you know, uh, there's mismatch of labels or some corruption, software corruption or hardware corruption, where the router is not able to forward packet uh, correctly. So at this point, what will happen is, now if you look at the same packet, R4, because the LDP is broken between R4 and R2, that means R4 hasn't received a label from R2. So in the R4's forwarding table, it says if you receive a packet with level 50, send it out as IP packet or send it out as untagged. That means remove all the labels and send that packet to R2 without any labels. At this point, R2 ends up with an IP packet with source address of R3's outgo outgoing interface address and the destination address is 127. Now, R2 is forced to consume that packet and process that packet. When R2 actually consumes that packet, it looks at the contents of ECHO, and in the ECHO, there's information which tells him that he's not the destination. So he uh, creates a, generates an error message and sends back to source address, which, was, uh, which, which came in the ECHO reply packet. So when R3 receives that reply back, now the reply came from R2, but R3 was actually trying to ping R1. So when R2 replies to R3, he will tell him exactly why he's replying and what kind of error and what kind of problem was detected at R2. In this particular case, R2 will say that there was no label for this LSP, so he was not able to forward and this LSP is broken at R2. So he'll give exact IP address, exact location of the problem. So we can pinpoint where the problem is. We could not do this with the regular IP, IP uh, ping or IP trace. 
same, same uh, similar behavior is uh, with the trace. In the trace environment, what will happen is, this is a pink example of pink, but when we do a trace, R3 does a trace, the TTL is one, the TTL is copied into the label, when R4 receives it, R4 decrements the TTL by one, so TTL becomes zero, and when the TTL becomes zero at that point, the router has to process that packet, and at that point, R4 will know by looking at the contents of echo packet that this message was actually uh, destined for R1, uh, and he's some of the intermediate router in between, so he replies back to R3. So the trace in this environment works fine. We don't have to forward the packet all the way to the other extreme of the network, uh, and the reply will be correctly sent by each router. And we will look at some of these scenarios again in the presentation. So in this packet, we, I've been saying that by looking at this echo, contents of the echo packet, the router would know what exactly the information is there and what the sender is expecting. So let's see what the echo packet contains. Here's what the echo packet's contents are. Uh, of course, we have a IP or MPLS header, which is, um, so this is the IP header and this is the MPLS encapsulation. And this is what we are showing in this. So we have IP MPLS encapsulation and anything from here all the way to these TLVs these are the contents of the echo packet, echo request or echo reply. Let's go through some of these fields quickly and then we'll see what exactly these mean. So first, first one is version number. So today version number is one. So for MPLS uh, echo and request, we always use echo uh, version number one. The message type, there are two types of message types defined. One is echo request or other is echo reply. Okay. The uh, next field in line is what we call reply mode. There are three types of reply modes. The typical reply mode that you will see is reply via IPv4 or reply via LDP based labels or uh, if, if those labels are available. But normally you will see, uh, well, one of the things actually I should mention is that when the reply, when you send an echo request, echo request we want to make sure that it takes exactly the same path as we will uh, send the traffic. So exactly the same LSP path. But the reply may not take exact same path because remember the LSPs are unidirectional. So on the return path, if you have an LSP, the echo reply may get, uh, uh, may get sent into a LSP or it may be sent via LD, uh, IPv4. We have an option here that when you send a request, you can save this field which says that there's no need for reply. Okay, or in, in other words, do not reply. This is an optional field uh, and uh, by default, router will always actually use uh, uh, value number two, which is reply via IPv4. Value three, it indicates that just like in IP, when I do a, a ping or, uh, uh, or trace, I can send some options, okay? So in the same way, uh, in MPLS, we are able to actually set this field which will tell the router to set this what we call router alert option, similar to IP alert. And the purpose of this is so that on the way back when the reply is coming, there are some cases, and we will talk about some of those uh, cases later, where if there's an inconsistency between forwarding, say, on the uh, route processor and also on the line cards, and you want to pump the packets from the line cards to the CPU. You can use this option so that the packet is pumped using this router alert option. 
The next field is what we call return codes, and this is one of the most important fields in the, in the packet. These re return codes actually encode the information in terms of what problem was encountered, if any. If anything was, everything is normal, then the reply will be sent with uh, well, uh, value three, which says that the downstream router has the correct level mapping and there's no problem and the uh, packet was forwarding correctly. But anything other than three may indicate a problem. So the, the receiving router, where we send the request, when he's sending the reply, he, send, he may set one of these values other than three indicating that this is one of the problems that he encountered. For example, he might set a value four and we'll see in some of these uh, debugs, uh, we'll see that uh, Rahul will set this field four uh, or value four, which indicates that that particular router did not have correct level binding. And this is why he's telling us that go and look at that particular hop and fix the problem. Then the next field is uh, what we call uh, sender handle. Sender handle is set by the sending router in the echo request. And the purpose of sender handle is to map the echo requests with the replies. So one to, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. And to keep track of you know, uh, the, the request that I'm sending, if the reply is for the same packet or a different packet. And it is possible that from a router, someone issues two instances of, say, ping packet. In one ping packet, uh, in one ping instance, I'm sending by default, say, five, uh, uh, five ping packets. In the second instance of ping, I'm sending another five. So we have, to, we have to make sure that first, we have to map the request with the, uh, or reply with the request. And secondly, we also have to keep track of the reply coming for each of the instances of the ping. Uh, so the sequence number is used to keep track of the multiple, uh, to keep track of the packets within, within the ping. Whereas sender handle is used to keep track of the ping instances. Is, is it clear? So actually here's an example. Let's go through an example here. Uh, there are some of the debugs. For example, uh, here we are saying that this is a message type one. So I initiated a ping message type one, meaning it's a echo request packet. And this is reply mode two. This is the default, which is reply should come via IPv4. And the sender handle, this the router set, the sender router, it, it sets some value. Say for example, in this case, this value, the long one. And the sequence number is one. The sequence number is indicating that for this ping packet, uh, this, for this ping instance, this is the first packet, sequence one. If the sequence shows two and the sender handle is same, this shows that this is the second ping packet of the same ping instance. Similarly, we have a, a sequence three, which is saying this is the packet number three in ping instance, which is same. If the uh, if there was another ping instance, then the sender handle will be different, and then we will start counting the sequence number from one again. And also, one of the problem in in the traditional IP ping and IP trace, as we uh, looked at earlier was that we cannot use that IP uh, trace packet to measure the correct delay or uh, latency end-to-end -end for the path. Because as we know that each, pack, each node actually fires the packet all the way to the egress router. So again, as, in, uh, as I gave the example earlier, if I'm tracing from San Jose to New York, I want to know the latency for the first hop, which is Las Vegas, but the packet went all the way to New York. So that, that delay is accumulated delay, so I cannot rely on the, on the regular trace to measure that. 
To solve that problem, actually, in the LSP trace or LSP ping, we have defined this uh, uh, timestamp field so that we can measure exact delay between the hops. And the idea behind here is that we have two types of timestamps, timestamp sent and timestamp received. The originating router, when he sends the packet, he's going to put his own timestamp uh, at the time of sending the packet. On the receiving side, on the receiving side, the same timestamp sent is copied back into the reply, but in addition, the sender or the, the uh, sender of the echo reply puts his timestamp into the uh, timestamp receive field. So if you look at actually this example, this is on the sender side. So sender says, I sent this packet at 9.59.07 at UTC, uh, UTC time, but the timestamp received is zero because we are just sending the, the echo request. We haven't received anything yet. So the receive timestamp is at this point zero. But when the reply is received, at this, this point you will see that this is when it was sent and the timestamp receive field was populated by the sender on the other side or the receiving of that echo request. So by looking at the difference between the two, we can see that this is how long it took for the, the packet to um, uh, reach from one point to the other point. Now if you note, it, note in this slide, actually it seems like it took about 13 seconds. So one of the important things here is that the clocks needs to be synchronized to get exactly the same information and to, uh, to get the correct measurements. Otherwise, uh, it, it will uh, show the incorrect information. Now, the next field uh, in the echo packet is the TLVs. Actually, TLVs is the heart of the echo packet because TLVs define basically what environment we are working with. Is it a LDP environment? Is it an MPLS VPN? Is it a pseudo-wire environment or a traffic engineering environment? Because all of that specific environment information is copied or encoded into these TLVs. And there are uh, five different TLVs which have been defined for, for these uh, uh, echo packet. The first one is what we call target fake stack. And in the target fake TLV, actually there are then sub TLVs. Those sub TLVs define that this is a LDP, uh, the, uh, this LSP is built via LDP or IPv4, or this is LDP IPv6, or it's a RSVP IPv4, V6, and so on and so forth. Or it's a VPN or a layer two VPN or a pseudo wire environment. So let me talk about a couple of these so that we can get an idea of what information we are encoding in this. So for example, it's a pure MPLS environment. There's no VPN, there's no uh, pseudo wire. If I do a ping from one router to the other, to uniquely identify the LSP that I'm trying to test, or trying to check the connectivity for. For LDP, all I need is an IPv4 address or a fake address, the forwarding equivalency class, and the mask. So to give you an example, we have a R1 and R4, two routers. And I'm trying to ping uh, 192.168, say 1.4, which is the loopback address of the R4 address. So all I need to do is just put that IP address in there because we will have unique labels for each prefix in the network. And this way you can identify each of the, each of the LSP uniquely. Uh, here's a packet dump actually which shows that this, uh, we, are, we are sending this uh, prefix plus the mask and this is the UDP port number and the source ad address and the destination which is the 127 address if you look at decode this. 
Similarly, if I uh, do a trace or ping in the RSVP TE environment or traffic engineering environment, then it's important because we can have multiple traffic engineer tunnels in the network. And it is important to uniquely identify which tunnel I'm trying to ping and which tunnel I'm trying to check the connectivity for. So in traffic engineering uh, environment, we can identify any tunnel in the network by five unique things or five, combination of five, uh, uh, five things. One is uh, the tunnel endpoint or the tunnel destination, the tunnel ID, which is uh, usually the tunnel instance, like tunnel zero, tunnel one, if you create an instance on the router. Extended tunnel ID, uh, which is typically the source address of the uh, tunnel, and the uh, IPv4 tunnel sender address, which is also the source address, and the LSP ID. LSP ID for each LSP built with RSVPT, we will have a unique LSP ID. So if you put all these five things together, you can exactly pinpoint, pinpoint that this is, this is the particular tunnel that we are trying to check the connectivity for. Tunnel one or tunnel two or tunnel three and so on and so forth. Similarly, to identify and check the connectivity for layer two or pseudo wire, we need certain type of, type of information sent in the echo request. And that information is the tunnel is built between the two edge routers or two PE routers. So we need a remote PE's uh, loopback IP address and the source PE's IP address, the pseudo wire ID type. Pseudo wire ID type is, for example, am I trying to test Ethernet pseudo wire or is it uh, ATM pseudo wire or is it based on SDLC? or is it uh, VPLS, and so on and so forth. So that particular information will be encoded there because you can have thousands of pseudo-wires in the network and you want to test uh, each pseudo-wire uniquely. And the uh, last, last one is the pseudo-wire ID. Each pseudo-wire will be given a unique pseudo-wire ID. There, should, there won't be two pseudo-wires with the same ID. So by again looking at all these five things or uh, four things together, we can uniquely identify that this is the tunnel that we are trying to uh, uh, test. And uh, so this is, these are the sub these were the sub TLVs for the first one, target fake, fake stack TLV. The rest of the TLVs actually, they don't have any sub TLVs. Uh, for example, the TLV number two is what we call downstream TLV, and that TLV is used only for the trace packet. We don't use that for, for ping packet. And uh, the pad TLV is to pad it to the uh, nearest octet to, to fill that gap. And then there are four, uh, TLV4 that if a receiving router receives a TLV and the TLV is malformed and he cannot detect exactly what is in there. So uh, he can generate this uh, error code four. And then the vendor, vendor enterprise code, which is, no one is using that today. Uh, that's the TLV number five. Uh, in the TL, downstream TLV, as I said, we will be using this for only the trace packet. It's not using in the ping. And there's some additional information that we need when we are doing the trace. For example, when I do the trace, uh, one of the information that we see in the trace is that for each hop, we want to see what is the outgoing IP, IP address at each hop. So what happens is by, by sending this uh, downstream TLV in the echo request packet, each router, when it receives it, they fill this information with, so for example, the NTU of the link along the path. Also, uh, outgoing IP address along the path on each router and the labels they are using along the path at each hub router. And this is actually very useful and we will see one of the scenarios, for example, by looking at this NTU and by looking at this trace, 
you can identify some of the mismatching of MTU issues in the network. Okay. And uh, Pat Thiel, we already talked about that. So with that, I will uh, uh, ask Maurice to come over and uh, finish the troubleshooting and, and the actual use of these NPLS spin and, and uh, trace packets. Yeah. Right, so uh, b before I uh, start the next section, I have a question over here. Uh, so I think like so since this is like a kind of a neutral event, like a non-Cisco kind of event, so we could take this offline. So, uh, so before I start my next session, uh, um, I mean I was presenting this same presentation like in another forum, and one of the feedback I got was from one of the chap and sitting in the audience. This guy completely wasted my two hours. He was talking about ping. Of course, uh, so. On another note, like uh, I was in Europe uh, a few months back and I presented this exact same topic and the audience was like, hey, this is what we wanted. I've been working on MPLS for the last five years and I hate to troubleshoot MPLS, to be very honest. Especially being on the vendor side and getting all the abuse from the operator when we run into issues. And surprisingly, if you look at more, most of the issues are very minor issues, but the problem has been that the troubleshooting tools available for the operator were not mature. So, so, uh, so what I'll do in this section is I'll take some of the live cases uh, which we have all seen in the past while troubleshooting and see how in the old days uh, we used to do troubleshooting with IP and how long we used to take and wait our weekends and how now with the new tools the troubleshooting would be expedited. It seems the coffee is not working. So anyway, uh, so the, the first one we have is, uh, uh, so now we have learned how, I mean, what goes into the LSP ping and what are the, all the contents are. Now let's generate this LSP ping. Let's put them into use. So uh, generating an LSP ping packet, when, when I first generate an LSP ping packet, I would generally use the target fix uh, TLV. And also, by default, we would uh, include the pair TLV. So let's take a very uh, common example. So here I have uh, uh, an MPLS. Somehow someone went into the router and disabled MPLS on R4. And my enterprise customer is yelling at me for some reason because his traffic is not passing through. I, the, the guy sitting in the north get the case. He uh, immediately he generates an IP ping from R3 to R4. Everything is perfect but the customer is still having the problem. Now what you do is, you generate an LSP ping packet. As soon as you generate an LSP ping packet, you get an unreachable. Why? Because, as Muktia was mentioning, when I was sending the IP ping packet, in this particular example, uh, R1, when he would send a ping packet, I mean, or send any data packet for that given LSP, He's a PHP router, so he was supposed to take out the label. So even if there's no LDP adjacency between R1 and R4, it doesn't really matter. You send an IP packet, R4 receives the IP ping packet, everything is fine, he replies back. Now, when I generate an LSP ping packet, R4 receives that packet, he looks at the content of the packet, it's an LDP fact, he see, hey, what IP address is this guy trying to ping? Oh, that's the loopback on R4. Hey, but there's no LDP adjacency between R1 and R4. He generates an error message. So over here, we're show, showing an LDP ping with, a, uh, with no verbal option. If I was to use verbal option in troubleshooting, you will see that I'm getting a return code of 4. And Muktiya was talking about the return codes earlier. So now, with the very first troubleshooting step of generating an LSP ping packet, I know exactly where the problem is. Whereas in the old IP troubleshooting world, I would keep on generating my IP ping and keep on getting successes, and I keep on saying, hey, Interpol, you are wrong. So now, let's move on further. Now in this case, someone has gone into R1 and has done some misconfiguration or for some reason MPLS has got disabled on R1. I generate an, MP, an IP ping packet, IP ping would be successful. Why is that? 
why would the IP pin be successful if there is no MPLS on R1? The reason is when, as you, uh, Muktiya pointed out earlier, when R1 receives the packet, an IP ping packet, there's no MPLS, okay, he's not going to do label switching, but he can do normal IP routing. He routes the packet. That is the fundamental problem with the IP ping troubleshooting in the MPLS world. Because remember, with the MPLS, the control plane and data plane are no longer the same. The separation of control plane and data plane. Now, what would happen with this case, and again, let me show you the verbers option. I generate an LSP ping with the verbers option, and you will see that I'm getting an LSP ping response from router 1. As soon as I see that thing, I know that there is some issue on R1 because the ping was generated for R4. What happens is, when R2 receives the packet, it's a labeled packet, but there is no corresponding label. He's in his LFID, he will see an untagged. So what happens is, and this is the exact same case the Muktiya was pointing out earlier, R3 generates an LSP pin packet, it goes to R2, label gets popped out, R1 receives the packet, when R1 looks at the payload, or in fact the IP header, that is 127-8. As soon as he looks at 127-8, he punts the packet to the route processor. The route processor looks at the content of the packet. In the content, he will see there's an LDP fact in there. Okay, and in the, in the LDP fact TLV, he sees that the IP address listed over there is not configured on any interface on this router. So this means that this packet had reached this router due to some error. He generates an error reply, send it back to R3 with one troubleshooting step, you have done fault detection and you have done fault isolation. So, moving forward, uh, Mukti earlier mentioned about the reply mode option. We had, so one of the options was the router alert option. We are all familiar with the traditional IP ping and the record route option that we had in IP ping. So now, in this case, what has happened is that R5 has an issue, and the issue is there's an inconsistency between the line card and the route processor. The information on the line card is not exactly the same as on the route processor. Somehow, the information on the line card has got corrupted. For whatever reason, for a bug or whatever reason. Yeah, bug doesn't happen, you know, I'm from vendor, so there's no bug. So, of course, you guys made some mistake over there. So, so now what happens is, I generate an, I generate an LSP pin from R1 to R6, the reply comes from R6, and the reply on it comes to from R6 goes to R5, and the line card since it's corrupted, it switches the packet to R4. The packet gets so gets goes all the way to R3, and R3 and it dies over there on R3, right? So R1, so you as an operator keep on sending LSP ping because someone is complaining that there's a problem and you don't get any reply messages. As soon as that happens, the first thing you should do, now that's a two-step troubleshooting process right now. What you would do now is you would generate an LSP ping with a router alert option. What happens now is when I generate an LSP ping with a router alert option, when R6 generates an echo reply, he would, and, that, and that, now this depends on how uh, this has been implemented. I mean, some vendors within one vendor also there are different implementation. But what would happen is, when the reply is generated, I would put a router alert label. So, on top of the regular label. So when R5 receives the echo reply, as soon as he looks at the router alert label, he punts the packet to the route processor. The packet goes to the route process on R5. R5 looks at the content. Hey, this is an echo reply destined for R1. Okay? 
and this is with the doubt to alert option. How do I get to R1? Now remember, it is the line card, the increased line card which was corrupted. Since I have bypassed the line card, I punted the packet to the route processor. Now it's up to the route processor to make the routing decision and the switching decision. Route processor, everything is fine. He, dis he knows that the egress interface is towards R2. He successfully sends the packet out to R2 and it goes all the way to R1. As soon as that happens, you as an operator sitting in the NOC, troubleshooting this problem, you can easily figure out, hey, there is something wrong on one of the router and maybe if I know the topology very well, I know that the packet might, be, the issue might be in R5. Because this problem shows that there is something wrong on one of the line cards on the router. So again, this is a, I won't say this is a very common problem, but this is one of the problems that we have seen all in the past. And using the router alert option, you can do again a two-step fault detection and fault isolation. I won't say two-step because uh, in some cases the topology uh, might be too complicated to exactly pinpoint where the problem is. So now moving on, like so this was all an LDP, and here uh, this is not a, uh, any life case. What we're just trying to show over here is that, uh, okay, the thing is, what we're trying to do with LSP ping and trace, we're trying to check the liveliness of an LSP. I'm not trying to ping a particular IP address. That's not the object objective, right? The objective is to figure out the liveliness of an LSP. So in this case, this LSP is created by virtue of RSVP, and I have a P term, I'm trying to check the liveliness of this LSP, and what we're trying to show over here is, if you look at one of the debugs, uh, the five people that Mukhtia mentioned is going through, uh, I mean, you see all those five people over there, and again, very, very importantly, the reply coming back is not through a tunnel, because T tunnels are unidirectional. LSP is generally speaking, are unidirectional. So, you're only going to check liveliness of an LSP one way. All right? So that's why we wanted to highlight that also over here. So moving forward, now what I have is I have uh, a custom, uh, what I have over here is two traffic engineering tunnels, two T tunnels with the same head end, but different tail ends. And what's happening is, I have a customer behind R1 and, he's, uh, and his traffic should go through tunnel 1. And all of a sudden, customer starts complaining, hey, I am getting traffic loss. I'm not getting any uh, uh, traffic through a network. What I do now is I generate an LSP ping packet. And it's, it, the LSP ping packet is generated for tunnel 1 because that's where my customer traffic is going through. I generate an LSP ping packet. It goes through tunnel 1. So what happens now is, due to some corruption on R2, there is an issue on router 2, and over there, the LFIB has got corrupted, and I'm switching the traffic destined for tunnel 1 into tunnel 2. So now, since LSP ping packet goes through the same experience as the actual data traffic, so when I generate an LSP ping packet, it would take tunnel 1, Actually, the black arrow on the yellow tunnel should start on the green tunnel. So it would go through tunnel 1, it comes on R2. On R2, there's some corruption, and the LSP pin would end up going all the way to R4. So now, in this case, when R4 receives this LSP pin packet, as Muktiya mentioned earlier, he's going to look at the five tuples in the effect. And those five tuples calls, should correspond to a P turn on the router. In this particular case, when we, an R4 goes through the five, through his data, the tunnel database, he won't find any matching for those, for those five tuples. Because tunnel one is not configured on that router. So what R4 would do, R4 would generate an error message. So when R4 generates an error message, R1 receives that thing, he would see that, hey, I'm getting an error message from R4. How is that possible? Now again, knowing my topology, I can, I can easily figure out that there might be, the only way the packet can land on R4 is 
there's something gone wrong in R2. Again, multiple troubleshooting steps, but again, this would tell you exactly where the problem is after a couple of troubleshooting steps. Would this be possible with the regular IP ping? No. So now, moving forward, look, so up till now, we, all you've seen is the troubleshooting case uh, where LSP ping is helping you out. Now moving out to LSP trace, and how that helps you out to troubleshoot the problems in an MPLS network. Okay. And this, okay. So this is a standard LSP trace. Uh, I mean, the concept is still the same, that you keep on generating an LSP, an echo request packet, and keep on incrementing the TTL, and the, the corresponding hops would, uh, when they receive it, they would decrement the TTL and apply back accordingly. The same concept. Uh, important thing I want to highlight over here is that in the traditional IP pin world, in the traditional IP trace, you have tree trace available. When you should do trace route, in some place you will see at a particular hub, you will see three outputs. Because over there, you have ECMP available. You have tree trace available over there. Right now, I can break the trace into two different parts. The path trace and the tree trace. Path trace would give me information for only one given path. In this case, in this particular example, from R1 to R6, I have two ECMP paths. Two equal cost multipaths available. The path trace would give me information for only one path. The tree trace would give me information for all the, all the paths available. Is that clear? So now, let's see how this LSP trace is helping me out troubleshoot a problem. The customer is complaining, your customer is complaining, you're getting some intermediate traffic response, right? Uh, the traditional troubleshooting methods, hey, maybe he's sending some big packets, there's some fragmentation going on, or any of that sort, what would I do? I generate a sweeping thing. Hey, I fi easily figure out, hey, 1500 and above the packets are failing. Do I know where the problem is? No. I've done fault detection, I haven't done fault isolation as yet. I do a regular trace over here. It does give me some information on the MPLS label. It doesn't tell me where the problem is. I do an LSP trace. I know exactly where the problem is. I know that between R4 and R1, I have a wrong MTU. The MTU is 1500. So with just one troubleshooting step, I know where the problem is. Yes, so the, in the downstream mapping PLV, if, if you remember, if you can recall, what Muktiya mentioned, you have this information of the MTU, of the given interface. One important thing you will notice, uh, in the traditional trace route, in the IP trace route, you get information of the ingress interface. Whereas in the LSP trace, you get information of the egress interface. Uh, this is a small minor thing that you might want to note. Now, let's take another T example. In this case, I have the same heading, and I also have the same tail end. Again, I have a customer whose traffic, he's sending some high priority traffic, some like, you know, he's paying some premium dollars to you guys, and his traffic should be taking tunnel one. And he's complaining that he's not getting the performance that he was supposed to get. His traffic was supposed to go through tunnel one. Right? What has happened is that due to some error, again, on R2, the traffic is switched on to tunnel 2. Right? Same error message that we saw previously. So now, what would happen is when I generate an LSP ping packet in this case, the LSP ping packet would come to R2 on tunnel 1 get misrouted into tunnel 2, goes all the way through R5 and finally terminates at R3. R3 receives this LSP ping packet. He looks at the five tuples and he matches those five tuples with the tunnel database on the router. 
and he finds a match. Because remember, tunnel 1 and tunnel 2 both are configured on this router. He is a tail end for both these routers. So he, so if you join the LSP pin in this case, even though the ping had missed the router, it goes into tunnel 2 and comes back to R3, R3 would find a matching uh, entry in his database when he compared those five people. He would generate a success. He gets a success. Customer is still complaining. The second thing you would do now is you would generate an LSP trace. When you generate an LSP trace, the packet goes to R2, the first half. Again, the packet goes to R5, the second half. When R5 receives the packet, right, he looks at the contents of the packet. He doesn't have tunnel 1 on there. He's not a midpoint for tunnel 1. Yes, he's a midpoint for tunnel 2, but all the, the five tuples are for tunnel 1. He doesn't have tunnel 1 on his router. So he generates an error message. As soon as you get an error message from R5, you know where the problem is. So again, the point we're trying to highlight is, in some of the cases, LSP ping would give you exactly where the problem is, fall reduction, fall isolation would happen. In some cases, LSP ping is not good enough, like in this case, where head and tail are the same. You need to have LSP trace, so there's multiple troubleshooting steps that you would have to do. Again, is this possible right now with the traditional IP tools? Not at all. So, now load balancing, ECMP. So uh, this is some of the, um, I mean, different vendors have different methods of load balancing, and uh, this is some of the stuff that uh, we in Cisco do. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail, but again, the concept is, and most of the people do hashing on either source and destination address, and uh, whatever method is going on, but you do load balancing based on hashing algorithm. So in this particular case, what I have is, I have if I do, if I look at my L fib over here, for a given prefix 10.201, I have two paths, two equal cost paths available. Right now, with this implementation that is shown over here in this presentation, only path trace is supported. So, if I generate an LSP ping, LSP trace mess, LSP trace, I would be only able to see one path. Even though there are two paths available, LSP trace would give me only one path because only path trace is supported right now. Now, if you see, I have used an option of destination address, 127.0.0.1. By default, we do use 127.0.0.1. Again, what I was trying to show in the last slide, we do hashing based on source and destination address. So now, I do a LSP trace with the destination 127.001 and I use uh, one of the paths, I think path 00 is the one I'm using. Now I generate trace for the same IP address with a different destination address. And if you see, I'm using the second path. The reason is now when I do the hashing, I've changed, the, the source address remained the same, but the destination address has changed. So now because of this hashing, this hashing has resulted in the second path. Yes, if you also look at the outgoing labels, label 20, which corresponds to uh, pause 00, and label 23, which corresponds to pause 10. I really hate this microphone system. No offense meant to you, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so now, if you see over here that, I mean, if you look, this is not definitely, this is not a very convenient way of figuring out where the problem is. Because we, uh, the IP veterans, are used to the old days of IP trace route, where IP trace route would tell you all the possible paths. Now, so you might be thinking, hey, I'm a smart guy, I just chose 127.003, I didn't choose 127.002. No, because, I choose 127.002, it resulted in the same hashing output. When the hashing algorithm ran, it resulted in the same output. So it's a, it's a hit and trial method, you would have to try multiple uh, iterations to, uh, to figure out 
uh, the other path. Uh, definitely not a convenient way, but this is one way we can do right now if you have ECMP. So, uh, with this said, uh, I'll pass on to Muktiya to talk a little bit about the late VP and OAM available. Any questions over here in the audience? Bec one thing I would want to emphasize that I mean, being I mean, I mean having done troubleshooting myself a lot in the past, I mean the the the, the first thing we all do when we troubleshoot is we generate a ping, an IP ping. That is the very first thing we do, right? If it doesn't work out, we'll punt it to the, uh, the the team who handles the lower layer, right? So, but what what we will want to emphasize over here is now if you are running an MPLS network, the first thing you should do is LSP ping. There's no point doing an IP ping. The first thing you should do is LSP ping because that's how you can uh, do a fall detection and isolation in a very short amount of time. And also, again, based on the experience, we have seen so many, I mean, as I said, like view operator, of course, like when you come to the vendor, hey, there's a problem with you. We have seen a lot of high profile cases for some very, very pretty issues misconfiguration. So with these tools available, now we can definitely reduce the MTR in, in our network. So with that, that said, I'll pass on to Muktiya to talk about uh, the later VPN OAM. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, okay, just one comment. Uh, <clears throat> of course, you need to use this if you have an MPLS environment, right? You don't have to use this if you have only IP. So how many in the audience uh, are using the MPLS environment in the network. So, okay. And for other people who are not using MPLS, they have your plan. Do you find it uh, useful? Um, of course, when you go to the environment. Okay. Um, so what we had talked so far was specific scenarios to troubleshoot IPv4 LDP, MPLS VPNs, layer 3, uh, or uh, traffic engineer environment. The third one, I have just a couple of slides, uh, is we can actually use the same tools to use and troubleshoot the problems in the layer two VPN environment. Uh, and uh, uh, in the layer two VPN, we actually call this functionality as VCCV because we are trying to verify the virtual connection liveliness or VC liveliness or in short, a virtual, connection virtual circuit connection verification or VCCV. And the idea behind this was that um, uh, to be able to uh, use these tools, we want to make sure that these tools work not only in the MPLS environment, but also uh, they can be uh, useful in the, you know, any other layer too. It could be based on IPsec tunnels, L2TP, GRE, or uh, L2TP V3, right? Uh, so it's just same mechanism which can be extended and applicable in, in different environments that you have in the core. And in, in, uh, in future, it will be, uh, this will be actually working together with the BFD and uh, LSP. LSP ping is working already. Uh, for the VCCV, the idea is for the, layer two, for the layer three, actually, the problem is not that difficult because the whole idea was to, when, when I'm doing a trace in the layer three VPN or, or uh, IPv4 LDP environment, when I'm doing the trace, I'm relying on the TTL value. And the TTL value is uh, when it expires, the router can actually process that packet and send the reply back to the source. But in the L2 environment, we don't have that uh, IP address, okay? So um, all we have is the edge routers, the P, uh, P routers on both ends of the network, 
and their loopback addresses. And we want to make sure that when packet is received, is sent from the local PE router to the remote PE router, because of MPLS forwarding, when the remote PE router receives the MPLS packet, which is destined for L2 VPN site, by looking at the forwarding table, it will, uh, because the, the, the way the table is built, by looking at the label, it will forward it all the way to the VPN site, L2 VPN site. And we don't want that. To be able to check the connectivity and liveliness of the circuit, we want that pin or press packet to be intercepted by the remote P router. Okay, and I'll give you an example what we mean by that. So here's uh, an example where we have uh, MPLS uh, or maybe L2TP V3 based uh, core, and there's attachment circuit uh, C, C here, and there's another C, and then we have a, a VC configured between these endpoints. And the goal here is to uh, check whether uh, the circuit is up and drained, and if, it's, if the LSP is alive. So if this P router from here, if I initiate a ping, when the ping is sent, in the ping we will use the same label information. If everything is good, what will happen is when P2 receives the packet, of course, when from the P1, when the packet leaves, it will have two labels. One will, it will have a VC label and it will have a LDP label. The forwarding inside the core will be done based on the top label. When the packet comes at the P2, at the penultimate hub router, this top level gate will get popped and this P router, remote P router will receive the packet with the VC label. And by looking at the VC label in his forwarding table at P2, it would say that if you receive this VC label, forward it to the C. But that's not what we want. What we want to do is we want this P router on the remote inside to intercept that packet. So we, may, we, we want some way of uh, of indicating to P2 that this is a ping packet, even if everything is good, don't forward the packet to the CE2, but reply back to P1, and if the circuit is up, just tell us at P1 in the reply packet that circuit is good. So how do we make sure that P2 intercepts that packet? So in ITF, actually, there are two ways of doing this. One is what we call, uh, uh, actually, so they call it type 1 and type 2 VCCV. In type 1, the mechanism goes as follows. On the VC label, before P1 sends the packet, he does put the VC label. But in, inside, besides the VC label, there's a, what we call a control word field. In the control word, in the first label of that control word, there's a, a one bit. It's known as a OAM bit. And that bit is set. So on the, uh, and we don't do anything on the top label. Top label is put as it is. So, when the packet is sent, now when the remote P receives it, he receives a VC level plus a control word with that OAM bit set. By looking at that OAM bit, P2 realizes that he's not supposed to forward this packet to the CE, but he's supposed to consume that packet. And, of course, uh, when this ping was generated, we will have an echo packet with that. In that echo packet, we will have a TLV corresponding to this L2 circuit. And in the L2 circuit, we will have uh, P1's loopback address, P2's loopback address, the type of the circuit, if it's Ethernet, ATN, frame relay. Also, we will have the circuit ID, the number of the uh, circuit ID that you assigned. So based on that, this P2, when, when it consume, consumes that packet, he will verify all of that information, whether it matches with one of the circuits available there. If it does, then you will 
deploy success and send a reply packet copying all of those things in there with the return code being three. And when P1 then receives it, it will, P1 will know that the circuit is up and running. Okay, so this is type one VCCV. There's another VCCV type and the need for that type is because there are some limitations on certain hardwares where we may not be able to actually save this control word or send this control word. So the alternate approach is that what we do is before this P1 sends the packet, we put those two labels, VC label and the LDP label, which was learned via LDP, corresponding to the P2's loopback address. But in addition to those two labels, actually, we shift another label in between, the top and the bottom label. And that label is called router alert label. Okay, and that label, label is uh, defined or, or reserved as label value of one. So level value of one corresponds to a router alert label. Now, what happens in this case, and, the, and, and we don't have to carry the control word in this case. Okay, so in this case, when P2 receives it, he's gonna receive the packet with the router alert label and the VC label. And the IGP label or the LDP label will be popped before that. By looking at this router alert label, just like in the regular IP environment, if you receive a IP packet with router alert option, that has a special meaning and that needs to be processed by CPU. So by looking at this router alert label and a special value of label value one, P2 realizes that he's not supposed to forward this packet to the egress C router. Instead, it consumes that packet, removes that MPLS encapsulation, looks at the echo contents, and reply correspondingly. Okay, and uh, I just put a CLI command. Just, of course, this is Cisco specific. Um, and if anything is wrong, then uh, we might see, uh, say for example, if this uh, circuit uh, or the circuit is down, or if the, the, the circuit ID or pseudo ID doesn't match, the egress router might generate an uh, error code, for example, four, indicating that you know there's something wrong and something wrong on the egress router. So one of the reasons for some of the reasons for return code four may be that we have a, a wrong pseudo ID or pseudo type, or maybe uh, different, uh, wrong source address. So again, I think these are pretty useful tools, and uh, uh, both in the, so this is specific to, of course, L2, but as we talked earlier, uh, same concept for L2, VP, L3 VPN. So the last slide is a summary, of course. Um, so what we are saying is, as we saw, the traditional tools are not very helpful in troubleshooting some of the problems in the MPLS uh, environment, MPLS networks. So this is why these tools were developed, LSP ping and LSP trace, and we lastly we looked at the VCCV. So with that, um, any questions in the audience? Has anyone started using this yet in the Anyone who whoever is using the MPLS in the networks? Yeah? Do you find them useful? Yeah. Did you run into the problems before that you could not when these were not available? Uh, not really. I think that ever since we implemented MPLS, we've been using it. Okay. All right, then uh, that finishes the talk. And if you have any comments, of course, uh, I put the email IDs, both movies and mine. You can send us any questions you may have. Okay? Thanks.